Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. hello. We were just doing some stretching. stretching. Yeah. <sighs> Welcome to the episode five of Mindset. Woohoo! We're one hour weekly workout for your mental health. My name is Virginia. And I'm Barbara. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, and as we're now in lockdown in the UK, we're making a special effort to focus on actionable and practical skills. Yep. And if you're new to Mindset, welcome. Uh, Virginia and I will be guiding you through today's session featuring our resident therapist, Daryl, who is an experienced DBT specialist, trainer, and expert supervisor with many years of experience in both the NHS and in private practice. Daryl, can you say hello to everybody? Hi, everybody. Okay, so if you've missed any episodes and you just want to watch uh, some highlights, again, as a reminder, you can go on the YouTube channel. Uh, campsite link in the bio of Body and Soul's Instagram at Body and Soul Charity and just click the link in the bio where you can find all the resources of mindset. So week one we covered the states of mind looking at when we can be driven by our emotions or by logic and how we can find wise mind by combining the two together. So week two we were starting to understand what distress is and looking at some basic mindfulness skills that can help you uh, avoid getting drawn into your emotions with the observe and describe skill. So check that out. That was worth practicing a lot. And in week three, we've learned what to do when our emotions are very, very intense yeah. with the stop and tip skill. Yeah. That's what we do when things are really cranked up. Absolutely, yeah. And last week we were signaling to our nervous system to calm down through using our senses. And that is the self Soothe skill. skill, which we did a bit uh, just, just before. We have some lovely eucalyptus oil in here, don't we, to help mm. us soothe. Uh, it is time for Mindset, Mindset on, on the Move. move. Over, Over to, to you, you Daryl. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, everybody. So um, we're going to go straight into Mindset on the Move. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to start the session with a mindfulness practice. And um, so what I want you to do, hopefully this is a bit different to some of the other ones that, that we've done. So I'd like you to sit in your chair um, with your feet flat on the floor and your palms resting in your lap, but upturned in a kind of open and willing posture. Yeah. And, and, and mindfulness is, is, is about participation as, as well. So no kind of slouching back. So see if you can sit up and, um, and just pay attention. So just follow, all you need to do is just follow my voice for this one and, um, and just notice when you drift off, you start thinking about other things yesterday, tomorrow, just notice it. And just as gently as you can, just bring your mind back to the task. So we'll start and finish with the sound of the bell. So sitting in your chair, I just want you to start to pay attention to your breathing but, but not do anything with it, just noticing it, and that will help slow it down. Okay, and then you may can maybe notice any areas of tightness in your body, in your forehead, in your neck, your shoulders. See if you can loosen that out. In your jaw, in your hands, feet, stomach, etc. So now what I want you to do is I want you with your eyes closed to see if you can bring up the color red in your mind and just think about all the things that might be red, tomatoes, letterboxes, whatever you want, all the different shades and tones of red, light to dark, and just let your mind wander through all of those shades of red. And now as quickly as red cam, I want you to see if you can just push red aside and start to think about orange, the color orange, all the shades and tones of the color orange, all the things that might be orange. And just see if you can just imagine a few of those. And then I want you to just let orange go to one side and bring up the color yellow. Maybe like you were looking at a paint palette or something like that and bring in all the things that might be yellow, the sun, corn, whatever. 
Just keep collecting them. And then we're gonna push aside the color yellow and we're gonna to bring to mind green. And you might be in a park for this one or in a forest, just looking around at all the different shades and tones of green, dark and light, trees and grasses. And then we're two gonna just let go of the color green. And we're gonna bring blue and the whole spectrum of blue. As many shades that you can think of. The sky, the sea. And then we're gonna push away blue. We see if we can find violet. All the different tones of violet. Maybe you can breathe into the color violet. And then as quickly as it can, we're gonna push away violet and we're gonna to go to brown, from light to dark, and back again. And so in a minute, we're gonna push away the brown. And I just want you to go back to any of the colors that we've talked about or any color that you like, and just focus in on that for a moment and all the things that might be that color. And then we're gonna move away from that color. And I'm just gonna ask you to, to, before you open your eyes, is just go back to notice your breathing again. Maybe it's sped up, slowed down. Okay, so what I would ask you is what did you notice what did you notice about, about that exercise? Where did your mind wander to? So any for everybody, you know, feed in into the chat box or bot chat or whatever it's called. So you can feed into that. Beth says, I found some colors much easier to visualize than others. And this frustrated me at first, but I let this go. Yeah. Great, great to want to let it go. And actually uh, a, a main part of this practice is to, is, is to practice letting things go. When we let things go, it's much easier to have an, an, an image in our mind, you know, whether it's swiping through something, changing colors. So, you know, like, like we talked about last week, going from one side of the head to the other or going from top to bottom, as long as the brain can develop a mechanism for that, it, it, it's much more effective than clinging onto something or, uh, yeah. you know, or micro examining it as well. And then we have uh, we have um, an anonymous attendee who says uh, when I was thinking about green, I was thinking about trees and then forests, and then I thought of a local forest nearby, and then started planning a cycle to the forests and the journey and how busy the roads would be, and it was hard to bring my focus back. Well, it's the practice is about bringing your focus back, and that's the di that's the difficult bit, but it's also the main part of it. The rest of it is. The rest of it's less important, the, the calming effect or that or the anxiety effect, that's less important than getting hold of your mind and controlling your attention and where you want it to be. Because when you're distracted and you bring your mind back, you're really controlling your attention. And, and that's the bit that you see in terms of uh, neuro neurological changes in the brain. Oh, and Mabel says she really likes to picture breathing colors in and out, like breathing out red if I'm angry. That's really, That's really good. That I sounds fun. I'm going to try that. Thanks, Mabel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. If, look, the, 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 uh, you know, the idea of this is not to be calm or relaxed, but if you are, then happy days and go for it. Cool. Right. I think that's... Um, it is. That's it. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's it. the end of that bit. Where are we? Tool of the week. Yes, it's time for tool of the week. So for this week's tool of the week, we are going to be looking at uh, emotions. And for many of us, it can be hard enough to recognize our emotions, let alone try to figure out what they're doing for us. So what we're gonna uh, have a look at today is like, what emotions do for us? What are they, what, what, what's, the, what's, the purpose, what's the purpose of them? So if I was to ask you, um, let's say that you were 
standing by a lake and you were watching a bunch of monkeys playing by the lake. Uh, I don't know, they were doing forward rolls, throwing their poo around, eating bananas, do, you know, doing acrobatics and the, and, and the stuff. And as they're there, you um, a crocodile comes out of the water and bites the head off of one of those baby monkeys. How do you think, how do you think those monkeys might react? Barbara, how do you think those monkeys might react? Um, I think, I think they'd probably screech a bit, but then I think they probably wouldn't do very much because they're, they're wild animals and they just take that stuff in their stride more than we do. Yeah, so I think in the first instance, what you would see is that you would see the monkeys beating their chests and screaming and, and, and getting quite distressed. You know, a, a baby monkey's been killed. Um, but if you, were to, if you were to go back to that lake a few, you know, uh, maybe a week later, and the monkeys were back there playing. How do you th how do you think those monkeys might be reacting then? Um, I think maybe well, they wouldn't go so close to the water. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. See, I would think that actually, I think that they're not going to remember that from a a week a week a week or two later. I think they would be pretty much eating, rolling around. You know, I don't, yeah, rolling around, doing forward rolls and stuff like that. Well, if that was a group of humans, right? Say there was a couple of families having a picnic by a lake, playing Frisbee, eating cucumber sandwiches, drinking pims or whatever. And a crocodile came out of the water and bit the head off of a baby, a baby human and dragged it into the water. How do you, th how do you think the humans might react then, Barbara? Well, yeah, the humans would be like screaming, crying, running into the water several at a time, trying to kill the crocodile. They'd be tearing their hair out. It would just be pandemonium. Yeah. And, and so what do you think would happen? What do you think you would see if you went back to that lake a few days later? Um, I think you'd see the police. I think you'd see a fence up to protect other kids from going near the water. I think you would see, you might see like people with guns looking for the crocodile to, to kill it. Um, you might see flowers that family members had left or other people left for the, to remember the child. Um, you might see a warning sign. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, actually I, I, I agree. And when, you, and when you think about all the different answers that, that, that Barbara uh, gave, what you would see is that, um, what you would see is that the emotions that people are, are having are, are the things that are driving them towards an action. So you might see, for, so for example, um, the people that run into the water to chase after the crocodile, they're angry, right? And they want to get that crocodile and they want to, you know, and, and they want to kill it, yeah? And stop it hurting any more humans. The, you know, when you go back and you see the flowers there and the commemoration, this is, a, this is sadness. This is people uh, showing that they're, you know, that they're sad and that they want to remember uh, the child that, that was taken. Um, I think you would probably see a fence up and stuff like that. What, you know, what you would see around the, the, the lake is, you know, maybe a sign that says, be careful, don't come, you know, don't come here. So all the anxious people would be wanting to put up a sign saying, "Be you know, be careful when you, you know, when you come and play uh, frisbee here." So I suppose what this tells us is that the difference between um, animals and, and and humans is really that um, animals work predominantly on instincts. I suppose monkeys have less than most other animals. But, but, but most animals are just instinctive, whereas humans have not only instinct, but they have emotions as well. And it's the emotions that they have that are, the, uh, that are really the guide. Um, so when we think about what emotions uh, do for us, I would argue, and this comes from evolutionary psychology, is that emotions motivate us and, and organize us. They get us ready to do stuff yeah and not only that not only do they get us ready to do stuff but they get us ready to do stuff really quickly yeah so if i was to take a hammer and throw it at barbara yeah 
she wouldn't, you know, she's not going to sit there and debate, oh, there's a metal object coming towards my face. She's just going to put her hands up in front of her face. Yeah. And then I'm going to throw the hammer back. And then you're going to throw the hammer back and probably beat me to death with it if I know you. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, and so it tells us how to act very quickly when we don't have time. Yeah. Yeah. So you might see Barbara close her eyes, squeeze her face together and protect as much of it um, as she can. So that's one of the things that emotions do. The other things that emotions do is they they communicate to other people. Yeah, they influence other people. If um, if I was in a restaurant and um, and, and, and I was sharing a, a, a meal with someone and I bit into something and I went, yeah and i and i made a really sort of disgusted face and someone else was about to eat that at the same time yeah they are likely to pause and wait before <laughs> they then eat it because it might be poisonous or or it might be off or it might be something like that so emotions always also communicate and influence um other people yeah so our body language and voice tone they're also hardwired yeah um and whether we intend it or not, the way we look at people has an effect on them, yeah? And the, the last thing that, that emotions do is they communicate to ourselves, yeah? Um, so things like uh, intuition, yeah? It is a response to something important about a, a, a situation, yeah? So our emotions tell us something. They, what, what they do is they're like a guide, yeah? And, and I would argue that if you understood each of your emotions as you had them, you know, especially for those of you that feel a little bit lost, you would never feel lost again because emotions are, are, are telling us what to do. And I suppose what I'll do is I, I'll, give you an, I'll give you an example of it. Um, if when people when people get angry yeah when people get angry they have so the emotion being and when people get angry that they, 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 it comes in two parts there's an urge what we uh, our first instinct what we want to do yeah and usually when we're angry what we really want to do is lash out or, or the urge is to lash out to attack other people to attack ourselves maybe we'll do that verbally maybe we would do that by throwing something Maybe we would do it against ourselves, you know, um, maybe we shout at someone. But when you think about it, um, I'm not sure that that's really the, 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 the purpose of, of anger. So for those of you out there, if you think about uh, Black Lives Matter or something like that that's going on at the moment, what you can see is that people are protesting, right? And they're getting, a, you know, they're protesting. But what are they actually after? What are they after? Is Marge able? What are they after, Marge? What do you think? I'm going to bring Marge in. Hey. Hey, Daryl. Oh, yeah. What do you think, Marge? What do you think they're after? Peace, justice, um, change. Yeah. The three top things they're after. Yeah. So what they're actually after, yeah, is they want the system to, to change and they want things to stop being the way that they are. And so what anger is really about is that anger is really about getting something or someone to stop or change. So think about the last time you were angry, right? And think about it. What were you, what were you trying to, what were you trying to get to stop or change? And maybe think about what you did instead. Yeah. And when we follow the stop or change idea, yeah, it, it gives us more information. And this goes on and on and on. I mean, and we could look at this in terms of uh, sadness. You know, if, if some, if any of you are feeling uh, sad, you know, your urge might be to isolate yourself somehow. Yeah, or your urge might be to cry. But if you go to the, if you go to a GP and tell him that you're uh, feeling sad, um, it's very rare they let you sit down and 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 and, and cry for hours and hours. What they're more likely to do is to maybe prescribe you some medication or um, 
or, or, or tell you to go to the gym or, or, or start to get um, busy in some way. So although the urge in sadness is one thing, what, what we're really trying to do when we're feeling sad is he's telling us to get up and get going, but also to problem solve. Yeah. So sadness is telling us we need to there's a, there's a problem that that needs that needs solving. So you um, so I could go on. I could go on with some, I could go on with some others. So I'll give you one more and then I'll hand back to Barbara and Virginia and then we'll see if there's any questions, um, if there's any questions about it. And this follows also. Right. So also thinking about um, uh, uh, feeling shame. Yeah. When we when we feel shame, the urge is to look away or hide away or run away or or, or, or something like that. But 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 shame is really telling us that there's a there's a problem with with a group of people. So the thing about the thing about shame is is shame is trying to keep us in our groups, in our tribe, in our family, in our culture or whatever. So because you think about it, right, in medieval times, right, they used to keep grain, they used to keep it communally in a big barn, and people would just go and take what they needed. But if you went into that barn, and you took all the grain, yeah, there would be, you know, and you took everyone's stuff to get through the winter, you might be in trouble if everyone find out, yeah, they might want to throw you out of the village. And in those times, if you got thrown out, or punish, yeah, you would die. Yeah. So shame was designed as a way to get people to repair their actions. So if you get caught stealing something from a village, yeah, what you might say to people is you might say, look, I'm really sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I um, you know, I took all the grain. Um, I, you know, they might commit themselves to doing it in the future. I'm not gonna, you know, I won't do it, I won't do it again, I promise. And what I might do is I might make it up to you you know what, I'll go out of the village, I'll go out of the walls and I'll hunt a deer, a deer, kill a deer and we can all eat meat, you know, we can all eat meat and uh, have something different to eat. So, yeah. And so then, then, it, then in a way, the emotion's done its job, right? It's told you to repair it to other people and then we, and then we move on and we um, let the emotions go. Yeah. So, Really, what I'm saying is that the problem with emotion regulation, the problem is, is when the urge doesn't match the goal. Yeah. So when you get the urge, so if I'm in the supermarket and I'm in a rush and, and I get angry standing in the line and then I jump out of the line, you know, I jump out of the line and leave it and, 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 and walk off home. Yeah. I don't reach my goal, do I? You know, so I go with the anger, but I don't I end up not having the shopping that, that I wanted. So has anyone got any questions? Has anyone got any questions about this? Because this is one of the biggest problems in terms of of, of of people regulating emotions is is this is this mix up. Is this clear? Is this clear to in the mindset room? Um, yes. Yeah, and that's, we need to, we're just checking the chat box real quick, Daryl, to see if there are questions from people at home. Oh, here we have a question. Uh, Lucy says, how do you deal with shame when it's not related to a group, but it's self-created? Well, well, Lucy, it, it's, it's not, that wouldn't actually be shame at all because shame is always group related. What you're more likely be, to be talking about, and I'm not 100% sure because I don't know the context, but what you're more likely to be talking about is guilt. And what guilt is, um, uh, guilt is when you, violate your own values and the values and, and values are things that are important to you um values are are, are not thick so values are only uh, the way of looking at values is something that's important to you and if no one else knew it it would still be important to you so when you go against what you believe in then um then then, then that's guilt so for example you know when they did those you know, when they started doing self checkouts in in Sainsbury's and stuff, the first time I used it, I did the shopping. I, yeah, I'm going to give an example. Yeah, um, so yeah, when I first did it, I remember taking the shopping out of Sainsbury's, walking up the road, and then realizing that I hadn't that I hadn't paid. 
and um and i looked at my value you know i looked at my values and i thought actually i don't really care about getting all this free shopping from sainsbury's they're <laughs> always trying to con me some way or another um you know they're uh, you know they buy one get one free they sell me jaffa cakes but they take two out of the box and they don't actually tell me that they're taking two out of the box so i'm not that bothered about it i just went home and said hey free food everyone yeah but other people might find that 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 that, that they wouldn't be comfortable with that however if i'd done that in my local store with the guy that i know his kids go to the same school as mine um i talked to him about cricket he's open all day long he's not got the greatest car you know he's closing up you know this is a guy that's working hard if i walked away then uh with a bag of free food I i'd go straight back and pay so so what lucy's maybe talking about is her values so you want to ensure so a lot of people with with high emotional regulation they think that they're feeling shame a lot but it's probably but it's probably not so the identification of emotions is is crucial in 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 trying to regulate them and okay thanks sarah and then and then another lucy says um is it ever okay to give in to an urge for example to cry sure um sure look there's two kinds of crying yeah sometimes and what you want to do is you know sometimes sometimes you can have a cry a great cry and you feel you feel really great afterward. You feel refreshed and um, and ready to go. And other times you cry, you just cry and cry and cry, and it just makes you feel worse. So for so for that, you want to you want to sort of bit, find out which one it is. Some kinds of crying don't actually help at all. Yeah. So Lucy says, yeah. Can we actually feel multiple emotions at once, or is it just us misinterpreting our emotion wrong? No, that is a stunning question no look emotions emotions come in bunches yeah and and, and they all or often they come with uh they, they come too and, and and most of the problems that with emotions come from or emotional experiencing is that you know emotions can be reactions to our own emotions so if you think about them for now in two right so an example might be i might feel guilty about being angry or I might be feel, or I might be feeling sad about being sad, yeah. And this is an emotional experience as as a reaction. So the, I I think uh, probably the easier way is to look at them in in twos, as as or what they call primary and um, secondary emotions, yeah. And it's often our thoughts and beliefs about one of the emotions that sets off the other one, and 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 this is the emotion myth stuff. And then, and then Lucine says, I always struggle with identifying my emotions as a lot of them come all at once. How would you suggest I manage this, especially if you're feeling displacement in your emotions, i.e. past emotions and empathetic emotions? Yeah, so, so, so the, skill of the, 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 the skill of that is, is actually going back a couple of weeks and using the observe and the describing skills because each emotion has a different set of uh, a different set of signals to it so that would be the first so you identify so if i said to you you know um my stomach's churning i'm pacing up and down um uh, you know and i'm full of energy yeah what emotion would that be yeah sounds like yeah. angry to me but sounds like okay so, but now uh, I'm smiling. I'm thinking positively about the future. Oh, excited! Exactly. So, what we, we what we need to do actually, emotions are really patterned responses, and um, emotions are very limited in the um, in, in the way that they manifest themselves. But we would want to, but we would want to learn about emotions. We would learn learn the context around them. What set it off? What were the body sensations? What were we believing about the emotion, and and yeah. and, and onwards? And I'm, I presume that we're going to uh, talk about that um, yeah. at some stage. And the keeper asks, is it bad to be an emotional person or someone influenced by emotions? Well, that would be judgmental, wouldn't it? If if you were saying that it was that, that, that it was that it was good or bad, um, you know, mostly. Look, some people 
have a higher sensitivity towards emotions than others. And if you have, if you, if you are more sensitive to emotions, then, um, then you kind of have a, a responsibility to, to be aware of that and, 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 and to mitigate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we, you know, look, emotions are neither good nor bad. And, uh, and, and, and what we want to do is we want to, dis to, to separate them into useful and, and destruct. Emotions can be useful or they can be destructive. Yeah. Yeah. And I can, can, I can see another question and I can give yeah. an example. Do you want, do you want to give an example of, well, maybe. This yeah. Is well, you know, if, you know, if, if, if I was out, if I was out in a, if I was out in a restaurant with my wife, and uh, and somebody uh, and, 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 a, and a guy walked past and, and looked her up and down, yeah. And I saw her look back at him, um, and I and my emotion was like eleven out of twelve, jealous, yeah. I might, you know, I might say to the guy, "What do you think you're looking at?" I might, um, you know, I might storm out of the restaurant, um, and I might get annoyed, you know, I might be like that with my wife. Yeah, and that is going to ruin the whole evening. Or if I was, if I was less intensely, if, if I noticed that that jealousy, what I might, what I could also start thinking is, ah, someone else sees the quality, you know, some of the qualities that I see in my wife. Someone else is admiring my wife. How lucky am I? Yeah. So emotions can, you know, it, it, it's often the intensity and what we do with them that. Um, that's the, the the useful thing. Okay, and then um, and then Ella says, should I ever try and explore with the emotions, such as I'm feeling really sad and want to cry but can't, or should it never be forced? Well, you would want to look at the you you would you would want to look at you would want to look at the message. It's like you know, is 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 crying gonna put you in a position to solve that problem afterwards? You know, because after sometimes after you have a cry and you feel calmer your problem solving uh, skills increase. Yeah, so that's, what I, that's what I would look for. So, so this look, mm -hmm. yeah, well, this links to what um, what Lucy, uh, another, another Lucy says, when you have a cry and feel really tired afterwards, what's a good way to get some energy back again? Well, look, if it's late at night, I'd go to bed and have a sleep. If it's um, if it's during the day, then I would I would use the I would I would use what we talked about last week with the tip skills i would change your body chemistry yeah, yeah. quick run up and down the stairs get your heart pumping um you you know use the sympathetic or the, par the, or the parasympathetic nervous system to to to, to get you going okay so you, you use it physiologically is what i'm saying yeah so we have one last one last question real quick what are the mabel says what are the urges and goals of grief i try and align it with sadness but it doesn't always work of, of the, the urges of grief. Yeah, the urges and goals of grief. Why do we feel, what's grief trying to tell us? Yeah. Well, yeah that's, a, yeah, that's a good one. So grief is a longer term uh, sadness. And, and what grief is designed to do is, uh, grief is designed to call people to help us. Yeah, to get, yeah, it's, like a, it's like a clarion call. You, you're sending messages out that, that, that someone needs to, the, to come and help. Yeah? Right. So, okay. so the message is, um, I need some, you know, I need some support. But again, right, unrelenting grief that, 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 that doesn't stop is then a problem because if people can't help you always and, and, and forever. And it would rob you of your self-respect and self-confidence if you just kept, kept crying. It's a signal that you need immediate help. Okay, and then on uh, an anonymous attendee says, I feel really disappointed in myself as I still feel so bad after all the positive efforts I've done, exercise, meditation, meeting up with friends, etc. Is that a question? It's not a question. It's just kind of a statement, but I wondered if you had anything to say to that because I'm sure there's other people here that think that, you know, we make a lot of effort and I guess it ties in with effectiveness, what you were saying before. We make all this effort and sometimes it doesn't feel like it's doing anything. Yeah, that doesn't sound like, yeah, see, that doesn't sound like sadness. That sounds more like anger. Sounds like she's more, sounds more like she's angry at herself. And, oh. um, and, and what I would say to that is that you want to stop and change that anger and maybe see what, 
some self-compassion can do for you because because yeah. if you're because if you're just criticizing yourself all the time then um then it's very that it then it'd be very difficult for the sadness to go away one of the difficult the difficulties that make it hard to regulate emotions right is is what we believe about them or what we think about them yeah some people think you know uh emotion being emotional is a sign of weakness yeah and so these are called emotion myths and the problem the problem with myths are is that myths are things that are derived from the truth but get twisted along the way yeah so if we were to take a, a general myth right so people believe that uh, carrots can help you see in the dark and that's true because in in carrots there's something called carotene and and it does improve night vision but the the the, the bit of that that's problematic is that you would have to eat 25 kilos of carrots every single day for six months to get a 0.001% increase in your night vision. So you see, it looks like the truth, but when you look at it in detail, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't bear out. And if you believe this, and if you believe this, yeah, this causes problems in the emotional experiencing. And there are different types, there are not only that, there are different types of myths as well. There's myths of the overestimator, and there's myths of the underestimator. So there are people that think, you know, well, you know, you know, I, I feel, I feel, you know, I feel sad, but I sh shouldn't show it, and that will, and that can cause problems. And then there's the underestimator, which is this is so, you know, I'm this is so terrible that I won't be able to to cope with it at all as well. Yeah. So, and then there are those that those people that do both. There are pe people that go across uh, uh, go across it so i'll give you some of the other myths that that, that that people have that you know emotions are a result of a bad attitude or um uh, uh, da, 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 da. there's a right way to feel in every situation there's a right way to, if, if there's a right way to feel in every situation right in um in ireland when someone dies they have a wake and people go to the house and they cry and they mourn uh, for days and days whereas in South Africa when someone dies they gather outside they, they drink alcohol they dance they have a party they celebrate their life so if there's a right way to feel in every situation what would you do you see because the thing is is that that people people experience emotions uh, very differently and if you believe there's a right way to feel in a, in a situation and you don't feel like that, this can cause a, this, this would cause the uh, uh, disconnect. Okay, all right, we'll you put just, up some stuff on the Instagram for, for, for you guys as well. So that's it for this, for this week's mindset. Remember then that you can send in any questions that you have during the week uh, about emotions or the skills that we've covered, the urges, all that stuff uh, to mindset at bodyandsoulcharity.org. And importantly, we want to remind you that mindset is not for crisis support. So if you can, you, if you find yourself unable to keep yourself safe, please contact your university crisis team or your university's well-being team. And the Samaritans can also be reached at 116-123. Yeah. So we hope you'll stay with us every week. And in the meantime, keep, keep working, working on, on your mindset. mindset. <laughs> Bye. Bye.